Jesus, we just thank you, Lord, for your presence, God. We thank you that we can trust in the name of Jesus, despite everything that we probably can't even imagine that's going on in the world at the moment. Uh, a lot of us are aware of, uh, just even trying to imagine how heartbreaking that is at the moment, but Jesus, your name still prevails, your name is still strong, and God, thank you that we have a place to come this morning to be safe together and just worship you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. shadows can't deny and your name it cannot be overcome your name is alive forever lifted high and your name cannot be overcome your name your name is alive that the shadows can't deny your name cannot be overcome your name is alive forever lifted high and your name it cannot be overcome sing his name oh jesus jesus you make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. You silence fear, oh Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. You silenced the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring. The praise of your glory. For you are raised to life again. And you have no right. You have no equal now and forever. God, you Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is. Good name. Jesus Christ. 
by the sound of his voice. But the seas that are shaken and stirred, they can be calmed and broken from my regard. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. Through it all, through it all, it is well. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you, and it is well. Well, it is well. 
Despite, I always pray some of the things, but despite what is going on around us, despite what we feel, despite what we see, because of what you have done, that can't be taken away, can't be denied. And because of you, it is well with my soul. Anyway, and Jesus, I just give you praise. I give you glory. God, we just pray for the situation in Ukraine. I know we've been saying as a church that we just need to continue to pray about that. So Jesus, just put your peace in that land, God. We we thank you, God, that you are sovereign over all. We love you, Jesus. Amen. I think with uh, communion today, we... Uh, we acknowledge this week that it's been a chaotic week and there's been turmoil and pain and suffering in the world. Um, but God is above this. And um, I think Psalms put it so well, and I want to read from Psalm 46 today, that says, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. And later in the passage it says, he says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. And Lord Jesus, we, as the song says, through it all, um, we, we will keep our eyes on you. So let's pray for, for Ukraine now. Um, God of peace and justice, we pray for the people of Ukraine today. We pray for peace and the laying down of weapons. We pray for all those who fear for tomorrow, that your spirit of comfort would draw near to them. We pray for those with power over war or peace for wisdom, discernment, and compassion to guide their decisions. We pray for all your precious, precious children at risk and in fear, that you would hold and protect them. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Amen.
Good morning. Uh, welcome. My name is uh, Justin, and uh, we're in our series that uh, is strapped. And uh, the kind of the idea behind this is that sometimes there are things in life, uh, and there are things sometimes in our faith that are just kind of holding us back. Sometimes we don't even realize it. And we're going through life, and we're kind of tied down. And throughout this series, we're talking about ways that we can loosen that stuff up and live life more free. And last uh, week, we talked about self-sabotage. The week before that, we talked about relationships. If you missed those, go back. Uh, they're online. You can check them out. But, but today, we are going to talk about the ties, the straps of guilt and shame. Sound like fun? You guys excited? Yeah. Guilt and shame. Yay. <laughs> so to get us started, I want to ask you a question. I want everyone to try and answer this. The question is this. What would you do if you knew you could get away with it? No one would know. You would never get caught. Yeah, see, these kids can figure this out. Like, they're like, oh, I know what I'd do. Yeah. And some of you are acting like, oh, no, nothing's coming to my mind. But yeah, something's coming to your mind, right? <laughs> Maybe I just need to ask you on another day, like when you're having a bad day or, you know. There's those days where the stuff that comes to your mind, whew, some of you filthy. Can't believe you'd think that. Now what some of you are thinking is probably shame. <laughs> See, guilt and shame, they're not the same. But a lot of times they're connected. See, shame is something that, that we oftentimes feel focused on ourselves. We can feel shame for even things that other people have done to us. It's not necessarily just things that we've done. See, shame, is, it affects what we think about ourselves, and, and oftentimes it's, it's self-focused, and sometimes we'd use words like, feel inferior, defective, incompetent, undesirable, unlovable. But guilt, guilt's a little bit different. Now, I suppose when I ask you that question, you are guilty of whatever you thought. <laughs> but part of what keeps you from doing that thing is a sense of guilt. This is the sense of right and wrong, right? See, guilt isn't necessarily a bad thing. In fact, the absence of guilt, the absence of right and wrong, yeah, that's not such a great thing. <laughs> we use words like uh, psycho, <laughs> psychopath or sociopath for, to describe people that have no sense of right and wrong. They aren't governed by those things. The, the clinical diagnosis would be antisocial personality disorder. Because when you don't have a good sense of right and wrong, it kind of gets in the way of your relationships, doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, that's kind of what makes wrong wrong. Wrong messes up things. It, it gets in the way. It always costs somebody something, whether that's you or somebody else. And it kind of puts us sometimes in this like debt, debtor relationship. And sometimes we're almost trying to, to make up for, for these things that, that we've done wrong. And, and guilt is, is something that, that we all feel. Because we have this sense of right and wrong, but we look around in our world, and, and we even mentioned this morning, there's a lot of stuff happening in our world. We, we see the chaos of this, but man, not everybody is on the same page when it comes to right and wrong, are they? <laughs> kind of an issue. In fact, even in this room where you would think that most of us maybe would kind of be on a, a similar spot, if I took a survey, um, I'm pretty sure we would find out that we don't all agree. <laughs> and the truth of the matter is, is that even in a place like this, it causes problems right? It can cause problems. I've seen it cause problems in church. And so maybe what we should do is let's just get really focused and let's get really clear. Let's define what's right and what's wrong. I mean, doesn't it sound great to be a part of a church that just is really focused on right and wrong, you know, makes people feel really guilty for being wrong? Does that sound good? No? Not, not, not the church that you want to go to, right? <laughs> because there's this problem. Sometimes we get super focused the problem is, is it maybe makes us feel like super righteous or the opposite, super guilty, which uh, neither are great. And the truth of the matter is, is that, man, it just doesn't work. James 2.10 says this, for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. See, there's this problem we have and either extreme doesn't do away with the problem. But sometimes we think it does. We think that denying our guilt and shame, or we think that maybe defining ourselves or defining our guilt and shame, we think that it will loosen the, the straps, the tightness that it has on our lives. But the truth of the matter is, is it just empowers us. See, denying or defining ourselves by our guilt and shame, it tightens, our, it tightens its hold on our lives, 
and it wrecks our relationships. It's true, it always happens. Whenever we deny or we define ourselves by our guilt and shame, it tightens the hold it has on our lives and it wrecks our relationships. But the real problem is all of us do it. <laughs> and I want to walk through some of the ways that, that I sometimes am prone, that you are sometimes prone to doing this, where we're inclined to, to, to do these things because guilt and shame are a real thing that we experience in our lives. Here's some ways that we deny our guilt and our shame. Maybe it's not the extreme. Maybe you don't say everything is right. <laughs> we realize that there's a sense of right and wrong, but, but when, when wrong things happen or we feel that guilt or that shame, we got to do something with that feeling. And so sometimes what we do is we just try and overwhelm it with positivity. <laughs> just be positive, right? Just push through. Keep being positive. Keep moving forward. And we push it down and, and we act like it's not there. And then somebody reminds us of our guilt and shame. And we're like, get away from me. We can't have anything to do with those people, right? Keep them far away. They're just negative people. And it actually tightens its grip on our life and it messes up our relationships. Or, or another way that, that we do this, sometimes we just kind of like, we rewrite the narrative a bit, you know? We just recreate things a bit. We look back on our past and we go, yeah, I'm guilty about that, but I was young. I mean, I, I, everybody does that kind of stuff when they're young. It's not that big of a deal. And we just lessen the blow a little bit, you know, we, just ways that we suppress and, and hold it back. Or, or we say things like, yeah, I did that, but I mean, everybody kind of does those little things. We just kind of lessen it or, or loosen it. Or we, we maybe look into our family situation. Well, I do that, but it's really, I mean, it's just part of my family. I mean, I just got that. And, and so we, we do these things to to kind of deny and push our guilt and our shame into the background, but the problem is, is that it's still, still there. It doesn't actually make it go away, or, or sometimes we just try to escape it altogether, right? Just keep ourselves busy, either through work or even good things. Maybe we just exercise. Just keep on exercising so you can't forget about it, or, or maybe it's TV or sports, or we fill our minds with these things because the guilt and the shame is we just don't want to deal with it. We don't want to, to mess with it, or sometimes it's, it's alcohol, sex, drugs. It's things that aren't necessarily bad in and of themselves, but, but when we're trying to deny our guilt or our shame, it begins to just tighten its hold on our lives and it wrecks our relationships. And we see it, but, but yet sometimes we're inclined to, to move that direction. Or other times, we, we go the opposite route and we just define ourselves by it, right? We, we feel this and it, it starts to become then a part of who we are. I'm not just Justin, I'm Justin the whatever it is, fill in the blank. And we define ourselves by maybe past behaviors, maybe attitudes, the way, the way that we are. Sometimes it's by uh, sexuality, by, by things that, that we're, we're prone towards, and we start to develop an identity about that. It just becomes who we are, and anytime anyone threatens that, it feels like a threat to who we are. And what does it do? We can't relate with these people. It kind of wrecks relationships. It doesn't help people stay together, but yet sometimes we do it. Or another way that, that we define ourselves, and, and I think religious people do that, this a lot, right? Like I said, when, when we do something wrong, it kind of creates this like debt debtor relationship. Somebody has to pay. And sometimes we look at our own guilt and we go, I have to pay. <laughs> and almost like a kid in timeout, we put ourselves in timeout. <laughs> and some of you have done this. You're like, I can't go to church today because I've done this this week. And so I'm putting myself in timeout. I'm staying in my room. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going around anyone. And we think that it's going to help us, but what does it do? It just tightens the grip. <laughs> and we've all been guilty of it. Or, or sometimes hyper-religious, like we get into this attitude of like, you know what? I've sinned against God. And it's debt debtor relationship, and it's not what God wants, but we feel like we got to go to church because we got to make up for all the bad things that we've done, right? And so we try and balance out all the bad things with some good things because we need to make up this, this, this discrepancy with God, and it just doesn't work. It just tightens the hold that guilt and shame has on our life, and it wrecks our relationships. Whether we deny or define ourselves by guilt or shame, it tightens the hold and it wrecks our relationships. It leaves us strapped, trapped, and enslaved. So let me ask you, where are you defining yourself by guilt or shame? Think about it for a second. 
Or where maybe are you prone to deny guilt and shame in your life and you're leaning into things to, to push it away? What if some of those things right now were to come up on the screen? <laughs> I'm asking myself this question. What if the things I feel guilt and shame for were to come up on the screen behind me right now? I don't think you would want to listen to me anymore. <laughs> I don't. I, I don't think any of us. I, I, I think, you, I mean, I, those things, we all have them. So what do we do with them? So Jesus offers us a different way. Jesus, he loved people that were full of guilt and shame, and he offered them a new name. Here's what I mean by that. All throughout Scripture, we have some examples of of people that, that God took their name, and he actually literally changed it. Abram to Abraham, or Saul to Paul. Simon changed his name to Peter. Sometimes he literally would change the name, but figuratively, he always wanted to point people to something new, a new identity, that they wouldn't be controlled by the guilt and the shame that they feel. That wouldn't be who they are, but he pointed towards who he made them to be, who they were in him. And he wanted to point them towards this new name. Jesus loved people full of guilt and shame, and he offered them a new name. Now, some of you, maybe, maybe you've grown up um, listening in a place like this, and maybe you know all the Bible verses, or, or maybe you just heard it in school, and you're not very religious, but, you know, God so loved the world. I think people realize God loves, but do you know it? It's different. In just a moment, I want to share some stories, because there's so many stories that I could share, but I just picked a few where Jesus, he showed love to people that were full of guilt and shame. And I don't want you to just hear these stories as just, you know, oh, it's Bible. No, I want you to experience it. I want you to find yourself in these stories. Because there are places in our life that we can identify with. So listen to these stories. And I'll tell you where they're at in the Bible. And you can go back and read them for yourself. But I want to start with this, this guy. He was kind of a social outcast. He was different. All right? Any of you ever look at yourself and you're like, man, I'm just different. I don't get along with others. Like, uh, people just don't understand me. They don't understand who I am. That was him. He grew up, and man, I would imagine that, that kids were just brutal with him, because kids can be brutal, <laughs> right? He was shorter than everybody. He probably didn't get picked for the sports teams, right? And he probably got made fun of, like shorty, short stuff, tiny man, <laughs> little leprechaun, right? right? And you act like, oh, it doesn't hurt, like, but deep down, it hurt a little bit. And maybe you can think of some things in your childhood that, that hurt a little bit. And, and so he said, you know what? Forget them. And he pushed through. And he was determined to prove himself. And so he became a tax collector. <laughs> yes. Finally, he can get back at everybody who's ever done anything wrong to them. Anything that anybody that, that made him feel little, you know, who's little now, <laughs> he's the big man. And people probably, I mean, they hated him. Imagine he was walking around town, and when people pass him, they would probably, like, mutter things under their breath. Maybe you feel this sometimes when you walk around town, right? But they'd look at him, and they're like, man, crook. Whatever it is, like, they'd mutter these things, or they would just think these things. But one day, Jesus came into his town. And you know what? He didn't care what people thought. He did, but he didn't. So I'll climb a tree because I'm short and I can't see and I got to see Jesus. And so he climbs up there. And wouldn't you know it, Jesus actually makes eye contact with him. And Jesus sees him and he calls him by name. He says, Zacchaeus, I, I'm going to go over. I want to hang out with you. I want to party at your house. He goes over and he has some food, drinks. Imagine they have, have a good time and they're just sharing life together. But something about it just changed him because he finally felt like loved and accepted. Jesus knew who he was, but that didn't matter. And he walked away, and Jesus loved him almost like family, like a son. He was changed. That story is in in Luke chapter 19. Uh, There was this other lady that, uh, growing up, she kind of found uh, love, maybe a little bit younger, and um, she was super excited about it. I mean, maybe some of you guys can identify with that. I mean, you, you get excited, and you're making plans for your future. Imagine that's exactly where she was. And uh, 
I thought he was the one. And, and, and they were together, and everything was like it should be, but then it took a turn for the worse. And for whatever reason, um, some of it was maybe her fault, some of it was his, but um, they parted ways, and it hurt, and she felt like such a failure. She felt like such a failure. And it took her a little while, but after a while, she was able to rename the courage, and she, you know what, I'm going to try at relationships again. And so she tried again, and again, and again, and again, and again, five times if you're counting, and she knew people were. In fact, she knew that people knew her past. She knew that they were counting, that they knew how many wrecked and terrible relationships she had. Every day when she had to go get water, she wouldn't go early when all the rest of the ladies would go because she knew that they would just judge her and would remind her of all of her failure, all the things that she wasn't, all the things that were messed up inside of her. And she was there one day getting water when Jesus came. And Jesus was a Jew, and she was a Samaritan, and and Jews and Samaritans, yeah, they don't mix. And at first, she probably thought Jesus was, like, playing a joke on her or making fun of her, but, but, hey, give me some water. Like, no. Do you know who I am? But he actually wanted it. He, He actually wanted to interact with her. And she was taken back at first, but she began to talk with Jesus, and she, as they talked, she realized that Jesus knew her. And didn't just know her, he knew her. He knew her guilt. He knew all her shame. There was something about the way that, that he loved her and cared about her that transformed her. It changed her. She walked away from that experience excited, changed. She felt like, like she was a part of, part of his family. Like he treated her like a daughter. And that story is in, in John chapter 4. Now, there's this other lady, um, she's married. Um, sometimes marriage is fantastic, right? Some of you married in this room, you're like, yeah. It's, and other times, it's a bit of a challenge, <laughs> right? And I would imagine, you know, there was the other ups and downs, but sometimes it's just the daily grind, right? And you're going through life and um, just getting through the chores of the day. And, you know, there, there was uh, this guy in town, she kind of knew him, and one day she was out and... Um, they flirted a little, and it was totally harmless, no big deal. Um, and, and she left, and she knew it was nothing, but it felt good. <laughs> and they continued on and going about her chores, and you know, day in, day out. But she'd bump into him from time to time, and and they would flirt. <laughs> and, and you know, she felt that tinge of guilt. You ever do something where you feel that little tinge, like, ooh, and and you tell yourself, ah, it's not a big deal. It's, not, it's just totally harmless, no biggie. She would tell herself that. Just keep going on, but you know, one day, maybe it's like a big argument, or I don't know, something happened with her husband, and um, she had a bad day, and she runs into him again, and he could tell. You know how some things, people could just tell, like, oh, something's up, you know? And he probably, uh, you know, doing what a nice guy would do. Hey, are you okay? Why don't we, why don't we go grab a drink? Why don't, why don't we go chat? Spend some time with him. He's like, it's harmless, no big deal. But she kind of loses herself in it. She ends up sleeping with him. <laughs> it wasn't her plan, but it happened. Imagine she, she woke up the next day and she just felt that weight. You ever feel that? I mean, something happened the night before. <laughs> and you're like, oh my gosh. And you wish that you could just go back and do it. And you're just like overwhelmed with this sense of shame. And I imagine she felt that. And, and she hears this knock at the door. And she imagines the absolute worst, right? Like, I'm caught. But unfortunately, she was. And they grabbed her, and they drug her out in front of everyone. I mean, it's one thing to be ashamed privately. It's quite another when now everyone knows. Everyone. Everyone knows. And they brought her out. And they brought her before the guys that were responsible for upholding the law. And adultery was wrong because wrong because it hurts people. It's a betrayal of a relationship. I mean, we we get that. We understand that. We know that. And they were out there, and and they were responsible for making sure that the law is carried out. And it just so happened that Jesus was there that day. And they knew Jesus. 
He had this reputation for getting close to people. They were full of shame, full of guilt, and caring about them. And they thought, we can trap them. We got them in this one. And they said to Jesus, hey, the law of Moses, it says that that we should stone a woman that is caught in adultery. What do you say, Jesus? And what Jesus, I'm sure he heard them, but he didn't listen. He, He just kind of ignored them. He didn't respond to them. Instead, what he does is he gets down on the ground next to this lady, gets close to her, eye to eye, and he begins to write something to her in the sand, just the two of them. All the while, these, these religious leaders are, are questioning, saying, Jesus, huh, we just asked you a question, and he's just not even paying any attention to him. He's just focusing on her. And then finally, he does. He gets up. And he looks around at all of her accusers and he says, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And then he just gets right back down with her. <laughs> just him and her. Imagine it was like one of those times where like the silence was like deafening, right? And one by one, they walk away. Until then it's just the two of them, just Jesus in her. And Jesus asks her, where are they? Has no one condemned you? I imagine this one was a hard one because she had to look at Jesus and, and she said no one, but there was still probably one person there condemning her, her. And there she was. But then Jesus said to her, then neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. He pointed her towards a a fresh start. I see your shame. I see your guilt. I'm down here with you. He literally stood right where you don't stand if you don't want to get hit by somebody who's going to get stoned, right? You don't get next to somebody who's about to be stoned. That's a terrible idea. But Jesus, he's willing to do that because he loved her and he he cared about her. And she walked away changed, changed. The story is in in John chapter 8, but we see this over and over in Scripture. And in Romans 8, 1, it says, Therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We all have guilt and we have shame, but when you allow Jesus to sit with you in it, it changes you. You're no longer this. You are a son. You are a daughter. You are no longer condemned. What is it? What is it, the the shame that, that you hold on to? Maybe like Zacchaeus, it was something that happened to you when you were young. Things that, that you hold on to, that, that maybe you don't even realize it and you need to, to think through it. Or, or maybe like the, the, the woman at the well, maybe it's a history of mistakes that have become to, to define you. Maybe it's the reputation you have. Maybe, maybe it's, it's that, that guilt that you say, oh, it's no big deal, but you know that it is. <laughs> And you're drawn to it. You don't want to be drawn to it, but you are. And there's guilt and there's shame. And Jesus wants to meet you right there in it and let you know there's no condemnation. And you want to know why there's no condemnation? Listen to these words. Isaiah 53. Because he suffered the things that we should have suffered. Jesus He took on himself the pain that should have been ours. We thought God was punishing Jesus. We thought that God was wounding him and making him suffer, but the servant was pierced because we had sinned. He was crushed because we had done what was evil. He was punished to make us whole again. His wounds have healed us. All of us were like sheep. We wandered away from God. All of us have turned to our own way, and the Lord has placed on Jesus the sins of us all. We're no longer condemned because Jesus was willing to take that upon himself 
to stand there, to take those stones, <laughs> to take the suffering upon himself. See, Jesus loved people full of guilt and shame, and he offered them something new, and a new name. But we have to move towards that. We have to choose that, and it's hard because sometimes the biggest person condemning us is ourself. And guilt and shame hurt, and they're supposed to hurt. Let me read this, this verse to you. This is in uh, 2 Corinthians 7.10. It says, Godly sorrow brings repentance, and it leads to salvation, and it leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. See, we will experience sorrow. Guilt and shame make us feel that, but there's different ways that you can approach that pain. The way the world often approaches that pain is you either deny it or you define yourself by it, but both of those options, they just tighten the straps, they hold you tighter, they empower it. Or you can allow Jesus to be with you in that guilt and shame. And it's a choice you have to make, and you have to actually do this, and it's a process. There are times where it feels like it just falls off you all at once, but there are other times where it feels like it's pulling you backwards, and Jesus has to keep pushing you towards this new path, and he's reminding you over and over, that's not who you are. This is who you are. This is who I created you to be, and you have to make the choice to move towards it. It's hard, and there's a lot that you have to overcome, but Jesus says, to those who overcome, to those who are victorious, in Revelations 2, to the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. Manna was what what God gave to the Israelites in the desert to sustain them. He will help you. He'll sustain you in this struggle. But I will also give to that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. (laughs) I love that. It it speaks almost of that that connection between us and Jesus, that, that he wants to have that kind of a relationship with us. In this white stone, there's a lot of symbolism to it. And we aren't told exactly. We're just left to look at this. And in the uh, Greek system, a lot of times white stone was a a symbol of acquittal, where guilt would have been black, or like acquittal. Or or maybe um, a lot of times a a victor of a race would be given a white stone. White's obviously a symbol of of purity. But in the back of the room, I have a a box of of these because I think sometimes, even though uh, this might be a little bit cheesy, we need reminders. (laughs) And so I'd encourage you to take one of these with you and to put it in a place where maybe you are drawn to define yourself by that past guilt or that past shame. I mean, the Bible goes so far sometimes it says to put to death (laughs) this because it's hard and it's difficult. And maybe you need to put this by your computer, maybe by your pint glasses. I mean, what is it? You know the things. You know the things that pull you the wrong direction. Take this as a reminder Because God wants you to move towards something new, but apply it. Remember, bring your guilt and your shame to Jesus and let him give you a new name. And the second way that you apply it is that sometimes you become Jesus for people that are full of guilt and shame. It's so incredible that we get to be a part of this. Paul puts it this way. He says, now I rejoice that I am suffering for you. Because that's what Jesus did, right? But Paul did it too. And I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regards to Christ's afflictions. It's not that Christ's afflictions were lacking at all, but sometimes I don't see it, and sometimes you don't see it. And we need one of his people to step in and to love and embrace us, to be Christ so that we can see it. And, And Paul said that he gets to do that, and you get to do that. Why? For the sake of his body, which is the church. This is the ministry of the church. Everything that we do, music, serving in the back, if it doesn't point towards this or aim towards this, it's not really worth much. This is the ministry. In the Bible, they call it the ministry of reconciliation, which is this big word. means bringing together in relationship, us with God, but then it transforms our relationships with each other. It points you towards something new. So do this. Remember, bring your guilt and your shame to Jesus, but also... Be Jesus, be Jesus' love and acceptance for others. Would you pray with me? God, you are so good. 
I need reminders in my life. I know that there are people here that feel the poles. They feel that the guilt and their shame. They feel the things that lead them towards the old. But I pray that you would encourage them, help them move towards what is new. Help them to hold on to who they are in you. Can I just play, pray a, a blessing on, on everyone here? And as we sing this, this next song, God, may we hear your words that you are grace for us, that you love us, that you care for us. May we agree when we say those words, amen, God, may we agree with you. Agree that, that we are not our past. We are who you say we are, God. We are who, who you made us to be and give us the courage to move towards that. And not only that, that we would move towards it with such passion that other people would see your love, that we would make up for what they don't see by our own love, that you would build your church. God, thank you for what you're doing here in Limerick, and thank you that we get to be a part of it. Remind us what ministry really matters. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Guys, if you want to stand with us for this final song. The song is called uh, The Blessing. And personally, when I sing this song, like I think of praying it over situations, people, um, Again, especially with everything going on in the world at the moment. Um, yeah, let's, let's pray it over each other and the world. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. Be gracious.
your family and your children and the children and the children may say be upon you in a thousand generations and your family and your children and the children and the children may his favor be upon you in a thousand generations and your family your children, the children, the children, they say, be upon you in the thousand generations, and your family, and your children, and the children, and the children. Father, right now, who are hurting and who are broken, Lord God. God, we pray, God, that they would know your very presence surrounding them in the midst of trouble, Lord God. God, you say in your word over and over again, Lord Father, God, that you don't abandon your children, Lord Father. You walk with us. You you never leave us. You never forsake us, God. But God, I pray that us here right now this morning, Lord Father, God, we would be people that are praying for our brothers and sisters this week, Lord God. God, that we're praying your very presence be with them, Lord Father. We're praying blessings over them as they are 
in this place, Lord Father, that we have no comprehension of, Lord Father. But God, we pray that you would make their faith strong, Lord Father, that they would depend on you for everything, God. God, Father, that you would wrap your really loving arms around them, Lord Father, and just give them the, an incredible peace, Lord Father, if you are in control and you are sovereign, even when we can't see Jesus. So God, I pray um, that, Lord, this week when... Um, it gets a little bit overwhelming. Listen to the radio and all the different things. But God, in those moments, remind us, Lord Father, that there is power in prayer. There is power in coming before you, Lord Father, and just bringing each person before you, Jesus, in prayer. We thank you for this time of worship. We thank you for the privilege and the honor it is to meet here, Lord Father, every week when so many people don't have that privilege, God, and help us not take that for granted, Jesus. In your holy and precious name, amen. I may just uh, leave you with a couple of announcements as uh, we're going out. The first one is there's a, a women's uh, breakfast at 10 a.m. on the 12th on a Saturday. So uh, if you're a woman, uh, you can go. There's a sign up at the back. If you're a man, you, man, you can't sign up for that. But um, we have men's breakfast too, so we'll let you know. Uh, the next thing is there's a worship night coming on the 5th. This is uh, next Saturday at 6 p.m. We're just going to be here in this room worshiping. Uh, we'd love to invite you to be a, a part of that. Hopefully we pack this room out and just... Uh, thank God for what he's done for us. Um, the next thing is you can see we moved our room around again uh, because things are opening up and uh, we need some more people to help us just serve in tea and coffee. Uh, we also are get, have more kids here, which is fantastic, and so we'd love some people to help us uh, serve in the kids area. And so if you would like to help us in that, um, there's some forms in the back. Just let us know, even if you have a vague interest and you don't even know what you want to help with. Uh, we will help you find a spot, but uh, we'd love to, to serve alongside you. Uh, the next thing is, you know, obviously as there's things going on in Ukraine, I know a lot of things, uh, you guys are thinking about that, and it's good for us to be able to send our prayers, because there's people that are worshiping over there right now in the middle of all of this. But the truth of the matter is, is that there's even people worshiping or not worshiping, sometimes here in Limerick, sometimes here we feel like there's a war zone, and um, that's one of the things we get to do as Jesus' people if we're a far away, we can pray, and, and we can be present through our prayers, but sometimes we can be present in person, too. And so even if you're here this morning, and maybe there's some things going on in your life that you need to pray for, we would love to be here and to just pray for you as well. But uh, you guys, thank you for being here this week. Uh, grab a tea and coffee, get to know somebody new, and uh, have a great week.